as an issue of um, of white coat primates. So, so here we are talking about primates who are caught in in the forest and then uh, they are brought to breeding centers. And in breeding centers, uh, they breed primates and they which which are then sent to to UK labs. So just for the um, uh, terminology here, F F zero that would be the white coat primate. F1 would be the offspring of the what of this uh, monkey, and F2 would be the offspring of um, F1. So, uh, Article 10 says that there is, uh, there is a timetable to phase out the use of, of F1 monkeys. So here we are talking about monkeys born from from wild caught monkeys between five and twelve years after the death, date of entry into force. Why between five and twelve years? Because at first there was a straightforward phase out, but then uh, when the directive went to the European Parliament, there was a very strong lobby from uh, from the industry, and they managed to include a feasibility study, so that um, depending on when the Commission published the feasibility study, uh, it, it will impact on, on the deadline. So if if the uh, Commission decide to make the feasibility study uh, this year. Then it's going to take five five years to uh, to phase out. If you decided to, to do it in um, in in five years or seven years, then it is going to take twelve years to uh, to, to get rid of uh, of this. So it's it's, it's a very polit political, but no nothing prevents member states to to phase out the use of of F1 um, monkeys. Uh, earlier than this, no, no, absolutely nothing at all. And in the UK, more than 50% of laboratory monkeys used in the UK are, are born from wild caught monkeys. So it's it's a huge proportion. It's uh, uh, about 1,500 monkeys every year, and um, that means many monkeys were taken from the wild with the conservation issue that comes with that. Uh, with also the, the suffering is, is a very stressful uh, it's a very stressful uh, experience for the for the animals the condition in the breeding centers in in Vietnam for instance or elsewhere are not uh, inspected by the home office the home office says that they, they inspect it but they have no power of, of, of inspection they only have a power of, of appraisal that means that when they go there it's a, it's a guided visit that they have so the, the, the the people at the breeding centers can on, show them only uh, a corner of the uh, uh, of the breeding center, and they don't have to show everything. So the, the controls on these breeding centers are very uh, are very limited, and uh, we have done a few investigation in in, um, in Nafovani in Vietnam, and on our website you can see the footage. And the conditions are really dreadful. Uh, however, we don't want to promote. Uh, more breeding center, center either, because if we ban the use of F1, uh, then the government might say that in that case we need more breeding centers. So in that case we, would, we wouldn't need taking any, any more primates for the wild. But what we want is a clear decrease in, in the number of primates used, so there is no need to use, uh, to, to take monkey from the, from the wild as a first step, because I think that's on the uh, on the middle term, we, we, we think that there is possibility to, to end all primate testing. Uh, on on um, the severity, so the initial intention of, um, of the Commission was, was to put um, a limit uh, on the suffering that, that, uh, that can be inflicted on, on, on an animal in the laboratory. So for that, uh, Article 15 says that subjected to the use, so subject to the use of, of the safeguard clause in Article 55, I'll come back to that later, member states shall ensure that the procedure is not performed if it involves severe pain, suffering or distress that is likely to be long-lasting and cannot be ameliorated. Uh, it's a very long-winded um, definition and the problem is it's a very broad definition because First of all, long-lasting and cannot be ameliorated. Uh, virtually any any suffering inflicted on an animal can be ameliorated. Presumably, it can be ameliorated. Uh, so it's not very clear exactly what this article is banning. But then again, we think that it can it can have an impact if it's implemented properly. 
and we, we were asking the Commission to come up with a clear list of what would be banned under this article. And um, I think it was last year, a couple of years ago, the, the European Commission uh, had a working group on severity classification. So, as you know, that you have three severity, uh, um, three level of severity in the UK, and, and the EU system is, is the same. So it's uh, the, there is a moderate and there is a severe, and above severe, that, that's the what should be uh, banned normally. So we ask uh, the Commission what would be banned um, under this article. And in the working group, when the, the, that is the category, they could not come up with a single example of, um, of, of an experiment that would be banned under this, uh, under this article, and under the upper limit of, of severity. Uh, so that means that for them, there is absolutely no uh, experiment uh, undertaken in the EU which is uh, likely to be long-lasting and cannot be ameliorated. And, uh, and that's, that's ridiculous. We are talking about 12 million animals killed every year in the EU, and they're saying that this article basically doesn't have any impact, doesn't, it's not banning anything. Um, well, this was uh, uh, before the, uh, the Commission, is, uh, before the, the, the directive was adopted, and now the Commission will have another working group. So what we're saying again is, is it, it's ridiculous to do an article that doesn't have any, any impact. If, if, if it's there, clearly it's because uh, <coughs> It has to. It has to ban something. So we want. Uh, we propose actually a, um, a classification of severity where we took some examples of um, of tests which has been under, undertaken in the UK in the last last year, the last couple of years, which in in our view uh, should be should be banned. And um, again, we're going to have to discuss this uh, with the Home Office and as a public consultation. We we'll give. Hopefully, we'll give an opportunity to everyone to to uh, to have an input on, on this article. Uh, the issue of, of funding for alternative. So there's a couple of articles in in, in the directive um, about this, and, and Article 47 says that member states have an obligation to contribute to the development and validation of alternative approaches. Then it doesn't say to contribute how um, it can be uh, presumably it can be anything, but in our view, contribute that means increase funding in in alternative. And at the moment, uh, the fund funding in alternative and, and replacement in the UK is very very low. Uh, as you can see on the point number three, direct funding to NCNC 3R, which is the national centre for the 3Rs, was uh, 250,000 uh, pounds. Uh, for UK research budget of 4.6 billion billion pounds, so that's that's a direct funding. <coughs> then there is some indirect funding that um, that comes from uh, government agencies, so it's still public money, but through government agencies like the Medical uh, Research Council or the Biotechnology and and Biological Science Research Council. But the problem is that these bodies have very have vested interests when it comes to animal testing. They're very very biased. And that, that's, that's a problem for, for the independence of CNC3R. And CNC3R also received a lot of funding from, um, from our pharmaceutical industry, including uh, GSK and companies like Unilever, uh, Dow Chemical, or Shell, the, the oil company Shell. Uh, so, so we think that there is a problem here with independence of the NC3 or because surely this, this body is influenced what's the agenda of, of this, um, of this uh, agency. So what we want is, is really uh, government funding for an, an, a truly independent agency that would uh, validate and uh, contribute to validate and, and increase the funding in, in, in alternative approaches. Then how much is, is hard to say, it's hard to come up with a number but uh, it has it has to at least at least a double. And another issue is is when it comes to validation because um, uh, validation is the process of of approving uh, an alternative. And um, at the moment, only one body does that in in Europe, and the um, is ECVA, the European Centre for the Validation of of Alternative Methods. And this. 
with this directive, and ECVAM has a lot of problems because it has a very low budget. Uh, every time when it comes to alternative, it's, it's low budget, unfortunately. And therefore, it receives a lot of application for validating alternative, uh, which means that uh, to scientifically assess them, but it, it can only validate a few. So there is a, there is a backlog, there is a bottleneck. And uh, this directive allows member states to designate validation centers in, uh, in, in, their own, in their own territory. So that's, that means you can have validation centers in the UK, in Germany, in France, and they can, they can increase uh, dramatically the number of, of, of alternative validated per year. Because at the moment, it's just uh, it's, it's very few, very few alter alternatives are validated every year. Um, so that that would be a point as well, where, where given given the current uh, political climate, it's not uh, it's uh, difficult to ask for for more funding. But uh, when you look at the proportion of of how much money the government spent into animal testing compared to alternative, I think we have a good case to tell the government now you have to you have to invest a lot more in in uh, replacements.